Welcome to Politics and More. As a big sports fan, I've begun to wonder whether a certain amount of reverse discrimination has crept into American athletics. And let me explain what I mean by that. Uh, we're all generally familiar with the history of race in American sports. Major League Baseball didn't allow black players until Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier in 1947. Uh, one of my uh, local teams, the University of Maryland, did not have a black player, uh, Daryl Hill, uh, on its football team until 1962. Uh, perennial basketball powerhouse, University of Kentucky, didn't put a black basketball player on the court until 1971. The list is endless. Black players historically did not get their due, uh, both because of raw racism and because of myths and stereotypes uh, about their physical attributes and uh, their intellectual attributes. Uh, the question I'm going to raise today is, have we come full circle? Has the pendulum swung so far that now we have a new set of myths and stereotypes that suggest that if you're not black, if you're not an African-American athlete, you may lack the skills and attributes necessary to be a great athlete. And I'd like to give some examples of why I think this uh, new mythology may have taken hold. Let's start with the most glaring example of this, and that's Jeremy Lin, uh, currently plays for the Houston Rockets. He was the author of Lin Sanity with the New York Knickerbockers last year. And let me confess that uh, I fell in love with Lin Sanity uh, right away. It caused me to renew my uh, NBA season pass with DirecTV, and I loved every minute of that. But I'd like to take a, a, a look at uh, Jeremy Lin's career and uh, see what it tells us. Jeremy Lin in 2005 was a, the leader of the Palo Alto High School basketball team. He led that team in Northern California to the state championship. They won the state championship over great powerhouse Mater Day in a big upset. Uh, Jeremy Lin was then given the, uh, the award of the Northern California Player of the Year. So he was in the headlines repeatedly in Northern California for his uh, playing exploits. So you would think uh, with Stanford University being just up the street from uh, Palo Alto High School, that they would have grabbed him in a, in a New York minute, no pun intended. Uh, Stanford had no interest in Jeremy Lin. Well, well, how about how about Cal? Berkeley was right across the bay. Uh, Cal was certainly watching Jeremy Lin all during his high school years. You'd think they'd want him. No, uh, we're not interested. UCLA, no, he can walk on here. He can try to play, but we're not going to offer him a scholarship. Uh, even uh, sort of lower level uh, Santa Clara uh, showed no interest in Jeremy Lin. So Jeremy Lin had also sent a uh, DVD of his uh, highlights to all the Ivy League schools. Interestingly, even in the Ivy League, only two schools uh, showed an interest after viewing uh, Jeremy Lin's DVD, and that was Harvard and Brown. And it should be pointed out that among Ivy League schools, the risk was minimal in inviting Jeremy Lin to play on your team because they don't offer scholarships. So it's not as if they were really losing anything by inviting Jeremy Lin to play. So he wound up at Harvard, where by his fourth year, uh, he had turned Harvard into a quality team, uh, a winner. Uh, they didn't make the uh, NCAAs that year, but Jeremy Lin was a first team uh, Ivy League and uh, you know was generally regarded as a terrific player. Once again, uh, he got no offers from the pros. He went undrafted. And I'm not going to go into the whole issue of linsanity because we're all sort of familiar with that. My question is, why after uh, the quality performances on Jeremy Lin's part, did nobody show an interest in him? Well, I think, I think we all know why. Uh, Jeremy Lin is Asian American. There is no history of Asian American excellence, at least on the point guard level, uh, in basketball. So there was an assumption that Jeremy Lin couldn't play. That is the stereotype of the Asian basketball player was strong enough so that Stanford and Cal and a host of other scouts who watched him play figured, 
yeah, I'm seeing a great player, but I don't believe what my eyes are telling me. I'm not going to trust my, I'm not going to trust the eyeball test uh, in this situation, and I'm not going to take a chance on Jeremy Lin. Kobe Bryant, who often says very wise things, uh, had an interesting comment uh, about Jeremy Lin. Here's what he said. Players playing that well usually don't come out of nowhere. It seems like they come out of nowhere. But if you can go back and take a look, his skill level was probably there from the beginning. It probably just went unnoticed. Well, that's absolutely true. Jeremy Lin had been playing all along. It's just that the scouts, the coaches, uh, the upper levels of the league, the people that did the drafting, refused to believe what their eyes were telling them. Let's look at another example. And this is what really got me thinking the other night. I was watching the NCAA basketball finals, Michigan against Louisville. I was rooting for Michigan in the game, and I admit that I was jumping up and down watching second string point guard Spike Albrecht knocking down three pointers right and left with the nerve of a bandit, scoring 17 points in that half. <clears throat> and I thought, well, Michigan is really going to come out on fire in the second half because well, Coach John Beeline realizes now that he's got a secret weapon. He's got a diamond in the rough in Spike Albrecht. And they're going to feed the beast and give him some more three-point shots. And he and the rest of the team will run away from Louisville in the second half. Well, I was dead wrong. I mean, not only did Spike Albrecht not excel in the second half, he barely got the ball in the second half. In fact, I, I kept wondering... Why are they ignoring Spike Albrecht? He's in the game, but he looks more like the last kid picked at a pickup game on a recreation site. In my view, what should have happened is that they should have run plays for him. They should have set screens. They should have set picks. They should have uh, driven the lane, kicked the ball back out to Albrecht in, uh, at the three-point line and let him do his thing. None of that happened. There was no effort, no focus on Albrecht, no effort to get him the ball whatsoever. Let me read you something that uh, one of his teammates said uh, about Spike. Spike has been working hard all year long to get to this point. People have doubted him all year long just because he kind of plays behind Trey Burke, star player Trey Burke. And he's a six foot white kid and no one really expects anything from him. For him to come out there on Monday night and play like that, it's unbelievable. Well, I agree. It was so unbelievable that in the second half, his players forgot about him. They thought of him as the second string player who really was an afterthought in terms of their strategy uh, and not what he should have been, a go-to guy. And I might add that Spike Albrecht doesn't lack for moxie. After the game, he tweeted supermodel Kate Upton who had been at the uh, final, and told her that he'd like to see her again. The boy's not dumb. So let's look at my third example. And this, this example is, is maybe the most painful uh, for me because it involves the Washington Redskins playoff loss last year to the Seattle Seahawks. Um, you know, I and my fellow Washingtonians still haven't gotten over that game, and we haven't gotten over the loss because it involved what I would consider the worst coaching performance in any sport that I've ever seen. That is the refusal of Mike Shanahan to take star quarterback RG3 out of the game when it was clear that not only was RG3 injured, not only was he immobile, but he was also hurting the team because he was so ineffective as a quarterback at that point that the Redskins couldn't possibly have won that game with him in there. So the question remains, why didn't the coach see that? Why didn't he put in second string white quarterback Kirk Cousins? Well, I would submit that it's not because of any malice against Kirk Cousins. In fact, Shanahan had gone out on a limb in the draft and had taken Cousins in the fourth round. The reason was that the, a mythology had grown up around RG3 that he's a superman, that he can do anything, that uh, there is no hurdle too high for RG3 to surmount, uh, a ridiculous stereotype uh, that he can't possibly live up to. Terms like freak and superman are superlatives usually reserved for black players. 
Well, Kirk Cousins isn't a freak. He's not a Superman. He's just a good quality quarterback. And after all, that's what the Redskins needed in the second, third, and fourth quarters of that game. A quality quarterback with mobility. Not a Superman, not a freak, not a Superman with an ACL tear who couldn't move. That was the problem with Shanahan's decision. At this point, we're happy if RG3 can stay healthy in Washington. Uh, we're not interested in Superman mythologies. Shanahan should have taken RG3 out of that game. He should have recognized that he was injured. He should have recognized that his best chance to win was with the second string quarterback. After all, Cousins earlier in the season had already won two big games that had put us in the playoffs to begin with. He had beaten Cleveland when RG3 was injured, and he had beaten the now Super Bowl champion Baltimore Ravens earlier in the season when we desperately needed a win. Cousins is a quality quarterback, and somehow the sort of Superman mythology that has developed around RG3 so blinded Shanahan to the reality of the situation that he was incapable of seeing what everybody else in Washington and all over the country uh, could see for that matter, which was RG3 was in no condition to perform, no condition to perform well, and Shanahan wound up hurting the team and hurting his player. We don't know to this day whether RG3 is going to fully heal and be the quarterback that he was before the injury, which reminds me that even this week, Shanahan is still promoting Superman stereotypes uh, about RG3. When asked how RG3's recovery from ACL surgery uh, was coming, he said he's going to set a record for recovery. Well, how does he know that? We're in, we're in April. We'll be lucky if RG3 comes back by September at this point. Mike Shanahan couldn't judge the condition of RG3 when he was right in front of him on a football field limping around. And he's giving medical prognoses that tell us that RG3 is going to, going to do this in record time. Nonsense. Let's, let's dispense with the stereotypes. Let's dispense with the mythology. Uh, hopefully RG3 at some point earlier in the season uh, will be coming back to join the Redskins. So my point is very simple. We would all do better to dispense with the stereotypes, agents can't play, whites are slow, uh, and trust our eyes more, rather than filtering what we see through stereotypes and myths. Once we do that, everybody will be able to make a contribution to their team that's determined by their real skill level and not by the stereotypes that we have about them. I'm Jeff Rowan. See you next time.